This next song we're going to sing is called Resurrected. It's a new song for today. And we're going to sing it on our night of worship, which is April 17th. And I hope you plan to be there. And uh, it's a really great song, really great message that God is changing us.
Everything we see, there is. 
God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that in 1 Samuel that there was that sign of help, that stone of help. Thank you that you continue to be our help even today. And we look to you and we pray that we will never forget how faithful you have been. We ask this in Jesus' name. line in that first song. Two lines, really, the way it was broke down, but prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave this God I love. And that's what we're going to see this morning, is we're going to see this, this man, this king of Babylon, and though he's not a godly man, he's been influenced in that way. And yet what we find is we're going to see, here's this man, he, he's, he knows the stories, he knows the past, and yet he's going to choose to go in a way that is totally contrary to what, the way that he knows is right. But don't we do the same thing? You know, if we, if we were honest, and we don't like to be honest, let's, let's be honest, we don't like to be honest. If we took some, some time, we just reflected back and our day, our week, and we just tried to recollect, okay, the ways that we have sinned. Most of us probably, we can't even remember. That doesn't mean that it, it wasn't there. That doesn't mean that it didn't exist. But we easily kind of wipe that stuff off of the slate, if you will, like a old blackboard or a dry erase board. And, and you've written it down. You know that it's there. It's like, well, if I can just get rid of it, I can just forget it, then it's not a big deal. And so we kind of do that in our culture. We kind of do that, especially with who we are in the, in the Christian faith, because we don't want to be confronted with our sin. You know, just be honest, nobody likes that, right? And I've, I've shared this with the elders, I've shared it with Sarah, and I've shared it with actually most of you, even on these messages and through this book of Daniel. And it's just, I'm getting a little bit tired of it, to be honest with you, because every time I deal with one of these chapters in Daniel, the Lord brings up something else specifically dealing with pride. You know, it's like, okay, I'm tired of it. All right, I don't need to be confronted anymore in the areas that I have pride in. And yet he keeps relentlessly, he says, oh, you also have this, you also have this. Like, how much more pride can there be that you have to deal with right now? And I'm a little bit tired of it, so I'd like to switch to something else, you know. But yet we're still stuck in the book of Daniel, being confronted with our sin, being confronted with pride. And we're going to see a contrast this morning. We're going to see, we'll talk a little bit more about Nebuchadnezzar and who he was, what it is, the, the legacy that he left. And we're going to look at this new king, Belshazzar. And I'm, I'm going to wrestle with it. I'm going to wrestle it with you guys. You're going to wrestle with it a little bit too. But my, my hope is that we're going to see and we're going to have to be challenged with some stuff. I don't honestly, and I've been wrestling with this all week because I had like two, week, two weeks to prepare because Chris spoke last week. Coming down, Lord, what do you have with this passage? I've went over this passage countless times, over and over and over again. I'm trying to think, okay, Lord, give me the one piece that you really want me to emphasize. And there's some pieces in there, but for the most part, there's something here that I think the Lord really wants to deal with us on. Maybe it's an individual level. Maybe it's going to be a little bit different for each one of us because there's a number of themes that exist with this Daniel chapter 5 passage. We're going to see pride again. All right, we've seen that all the way from the get-go, right from the start of, of the book of Daniel. We're going to see that again. We're going to see the sovereignty of God again, recognizing that he is great. We're going to see character in, in Daniel. We're going to see that Daniel basically lives his life, and I, I'm saying it now in case I forget to say it later. We're going to see Daniel, he lives his life to the full extent, I feel, that Carson Wentz uses to epitomize his life. So Carson Wentz came out with a clothing line just before I think he went to the Eagles right out of college and such. Like, how do you do that? You know, you finish college and now you have clothing contracts. You know, uh, there was this one guy from Duke. You know, that's where they're saying they got, what, five different tennis shoe or, or basketball shoe companies that want to use him to en endorse their products. And so right out of college, this guy is getting like millions of dollars just to say, I wear Nike shoes, you know. Uh, nobody asked me to do that when I graduated high school or college. Um, they apparently didn't see my athletic prowess the way I did. Okay? 
But Carson Wentz, when, when he came out of college, he had this, this you know, tagline that he kind of tried to live his life by, and it was this audience of one. And so you have this, there's this clothing line, it's the A-0-1 on it, and he's got in the O, he's got a cross, and he actually has a tattooed on his wrist. This is not to say you should go get tattoos, but that, you know, to each his own, okay? So parents who are saying, I don't want my children to have tattoos, I'm not saying, oh, Pastor Ryan said you go get a tattoo. For those of you who have tattoos, it's like, that's fine, I don't care, Okay. So now that I've kind of, just kind of washed my hands of both sides of that. Anyway, it's like, like Pontius Pilate when he's encountering Jesus, you know, I wash my hands of it, now I'm innocent. Okay. But anyway, he's got a tattooed on his wrist so much so that it's a reminder to him that that's, in a sense, what he's trying to live by. He's living for an audience of one. In other words, what he's getting at is, I don't care what you think about me. I care only about how God is viewing the decisions that I make. And we're going to see that in the life of Daniel this morning. Daniel, and he's really only in this chapter, a very short piece. But his life is reflected from before, and then you see what happens. And, and that can only happen, I feel, because he has lived his life in such a way that he's, that he's held to that fact of audience of one. We'll see it again next time in Daniel chapter 6. Um, so, I don't know where we're going to start. We're just going to get started, I guess, with the scripture and see where we end up. Uh, on the back of your, your worship folders this morning, there's some questions, okay? Here's what I want to invite you to do. You can do this at any time during the service. I'm not going to be offended if you just, like, not listen to what I'm saying because the Lord's doing something in your heart right now, and you're just like, okay, he's checked me. But I just look at those questions. It's the idea of value. What is it that you value? We've talked about this before. This is nothing new. You know, an interesting recent study that showed the, you know, um, what was it the gross domestic product type idea that, you know, so it's a very secular view, looked at what people value the most. You know, and there are certain things in dealing with money and monetary, but the bottom line of it was said the higher the gross domestic product value was, in other words, the higher equality of life that people live based on economic reasons had nothing to do with the quality of life that they lived. You understand what I'm saying? So in other words, the more money you have had nothing to do with how happy you were. That's kind of putting it a little bit into that context. And they were struck by this because they looked at some of these poor countries and they looked at the U.S. and some of these wealthy countries and the ones that had a higher uh, gross domestic product. It's like, wow, this, this is a wealthy country. You'd think that someone's stepping in here. They've got food. They've got water. They've got shelter. All their needs are provided for. They have extra that they can buy TVs with. Uh, it's interesting. I had to replace our television set recently. Um, we had one of those, this was a few years ago, one of those big, thick, and stupid TVs, okay? You, you, you say your, your TV, turn on, and it won't turn on, you know, but this big, thick, stupid one is still would work with the remote control. Almost 20 years old, never had a problem. And then what do we do? We, well, we're going to upgrade. They call it upgrading. So you upgrade to a flat screen TV. Well, they're only smart for a year and a half, and then they go black, and you can't do anything with them, you know? TV, TV repairmans look at you, and if you bring that in, it's like, what are you, dumb? It's going to cost you more to have me fix this thing than it is just to go buy a new one. Whatever. And, of course, it's a one-year warranty, and it goes bad when? One year. Yeah, year, year and a half, whatever the case is. Okay, someone in that ballpark, you can guarantee it. So when, it's, when they give the option to buy the extended warranty, what do you do? Don't buy Say no. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, back, back to more important things. I don't know where I... What did that have to do with anything? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Whatever. I don't know what I was doing. Oh, the back of the bulletin. That's what it was. Okay. Uh, so value. So what is it that you value? And let's, let's, I got to be, ask you to be honest with this. We know the answers that we're supposed to put down. I'm not dumb. I know that, okay, when you're asked this question in church, you put your answers in a certain way. I'm asking you not to do that just because you're sitting in church. And so that's why I'm saying anytime throughout the message, throughout the service this morning, if the Lord says, you know, wow, I didn't realize I valued that so much. Write it down. I value winning more than I thought I did. And I thought I was past that. I've, seriously, I thought I was like, well, I've, I'm learning to lose. Apparently I'm not. Okay? So I'm asking you to be honest with that because that is going to reflect really what I think the Lord needs to do in us this morning. Because where we put and find our value really affects how we live our lives. Because I've seen it many times where I say, oh, you know, what, what's, your most, what's your greatest value? Oh, I value my relationship with Jesus. I get that. I believe that. Yet our hearts are what? Prone to wander. Our hearts are what? 
prone to leave the God I love. And that's true. That's why just like as we're singing that song, it's like that is 100% spot on. We are prone to do that. That's not what God wants for us. So let's be honest with what we value because our, our, our hearts can be drawn to those other things that we find value in, whether it's money, whether it's our television sets, whether it's, you know, the Final Four NCAA basketball. I'm not a basketball guy. So, except for the fact that, you know, you fill out a bracket, you want your bracket to do well. Well, mine never does, so what do I care? So I want you to reflect on that as we go through. So don't, don't be afraid to, to write down as we hit this message. So what we're going to do is pretty much we're going to look at this passage. Okay? There's a few verses that we're going to omit just for the sake of time. There's roughly 30 verses in this, this chapter in Daniel 5, but they're relatively lengthy. So as we get started, here's what we're going to find. If you remember back, this is, this is Daniel chapter 5. We've been at this. Now this is our fifth week in the book of Daniel. We've covered one chapter each week. When we look at, if you remember back to Daniel chapter 1, that's when Nebuchadnezzar came to power. Nebuchadnezzar, he was not the first king of this Neo-Babylonian era. His dad was. I'm not going to pronounce most of these names. You're going to see them reflected up here in a little bit. But they're just, they're Babylonian names and I don't speak Babylonian. So really what we end up finding in 605 BC, 600 years before uh, Christ came, we saw Babylon go up, okay, and they defeated, Car- at Carchemish, they defeated the uh, Assyrians, okay, the Assyrian army. They go up and they conquer. Egypt was coming up to help, if you remember that story, and it was here, in, you know, from Jerusalem, but it was in Megiddo that, uh, what was it, Josiah confronted the Egyptians and kind of, de- de- you know, deterred them from being up there in that battle of Carchemish. However, he was, ended up defeated. Uh, this, that, and the other thing, Jehoiakim became king of Jerusalem. Anyway, long story short, what we ended up finding is Nebuchadnezzar wins that battle. Nebuchadnezzar then goes over into Jerusalem, and he captures the city of Jerusalem, and he takes back with him exiles. He takes back the best and the brightest. Great strategy when it comes to uh, why he did it in regards to kind of keeping Israel in check. So great strategy in that regard. But in this process, he carries back Daniel. He carries back Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's three trips that he makes. There's a second trip. That's the time he brings back Ezekiel, some of these other prophets of God. Again, the, the really bright uh, people that know their leaders. And then there's a final trip. He actually goes and he actually destroys the temple at that time. He destroys the city of Jerusalem. And you'll see that. And you can read about that in Nehemiah. You can read about that in Ezra, where they actually go and start rebuilding that which he has destroyed. And we'll, we'll touch on just that bit of that transition here as we move on. So anyway, so Nebuchadnezzar goes in. He conquers Jerusalem. He brings them back in. Nebuchadnezzar was king for like 43 years. And he prospered. You know, we saw some of the evidence of that through his dreams that he shared with Daniel about how there was this big, tall statue. He had this dream, the head of gold, the torso of, of silver, the hips of bronze, and then the legs of iron. And Daniel is the one that said to him, you are that, that head of gold. I mean, you're just like huge. You're precious. You're, that's amazing. He makes this statue for himself, this, that, and the other thing. And then we found out the last time we were together, he had another dream, Nebuchadnezzar did. And this time it was like he saw this big tree. And, and Daniel says, guess what, Nebuchadnezzar? You are that tree. I mean, you're amazing. You're just a beautiful tree, and what you did, you provided all this shelter for people. You provided all this food and all this fruit. However, there was a problem with you, and that was your arrogance. That was your pride. Remember, he was looking out on the city, and he was looking, look at all that I have done. We talked about those hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the world. And we talked about these great walls. We'll touch on that a little bit more again this morning in just a few moments. These great walls, they said a four-horse chariot could do a U-turn on these great walls. They're like some 40 feet almost, 32 to 40 feet wide are these walls. Kevin, help me out. What's the dimensions of our room in here? 40 by 60. Yeah, okay. So basically, that's as thick as these walls are. Isn't that nuts? That's thick. And so you look at what it would take for an army to come in and, and conquer that, knock down those walls, not likely. And we'll look at that here, like I said, in just a moment. So here was Nebuchadnezzar, but then God cut him down. God said, you know, in this vision, he cut off the branches, and God took him down, and he sent them out of the, the city, and he said, basically, you're going to live with the animals for seven years, and you're going to eat grass like an ox. And so Nebuchadnezzar does that, and it specifies until what? Until he put his eyes off of himself and put his eyes up to heaven. And the Bible says that when he, as soon as he did that, and he got his eyes off of his own selfishness, he got his eyes off of his own greed and all this stuff, and he looked towards heaven, it says his sanity was retur- restored to him, and so was his kingship and his kingdom. And so then Nebuchadnezzar then was back on the throne. Don't know how many more years that was at that time. He died. I'm not going to get the year right. We'll, I have it up here in a second. But he died 43 years after he had reigned. Okay, so he had reigned for, do the math. You'll see it in here in a second. So he had reigned. And then obviously, as life goes, 
uh, death cuts up, catches up with all of us, right? There's two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. Tax day is coming up. Enjoy that, okay? So here is a picture, and this goes to show a little bit as to what Nebuchadnezzar was. This is a reconstructed model of the gate. This is the main gate to the city of Babylon. It's just the gate. It's not the walls. But it gives you a little bit of this grand nature of what you're looking at. Because what was happening here, as we flick back, what we're going to see here today is Persia. We have Media, Media and Persia. This Medo-Persian empire is going to come in and conquer Babylon. It's interesting to note, every great nation in the world has always collapsed. Isn't that something? There's not one that has stood. What does that say about us in the U.S.? Let's not talk about that because that's uncomfortable, right? But even as we look at Scripture, we'll look at it more as we get into some of the further eschatological emphasis in Daniel as well as Revelation that it kind of points to this reality that, sorry, it's all going to perish. You see it in the end when you look at what Revelation says. Guess what? I'm making a new heaven and a new earth. And what? The old earth will what? Pass away. And so we can be confident of this. We're up the creek at some point. I don't know when. Some days I'm thinking, let let it be today. Other days, maybe it's like, okay, wait a minute, I'm fishing, I'm really having a good time, okay? But what we're going to see is King Cyrus is going to come in from Persia, and he's going to attack Babylon. And I, this is not in the text, but historically, and you can find this in other places of the Scripture when this happens, like in Chronicles, uh, Ezra refers to it. And so in the context of this, you actually see it, and we'll touch on this, I think, in Psalm 115. Psalm 115, no, it's not either. It's uh, Isaiah 45. We'll end with that here later today. Isaiah 45 actually talks about in this prophecy of Cyrus and what Cyrus is going to come in and do, this king of Persia is going to come in and do to Babylon. It's really great. But it points to this reality of here we have God has ordained, he has orchestrated all this stuff. That's that sovereign piece. And so what we have is here's, here's the gate. And this gives you a little bit of a picture. Now, some... I I had some discrepancies as I searched out how high were these walls. Some say that these walls were as high as 350 feet. Like an average water tower is roughly 100 to 110 feet tall. You know, so you look at now you've got three of them. Some believe that that's exaggerated. Fine. Even if it's exaggerated, there's a belief that these walls were minimally 50 feet high, if not upwards near 75, 100, 150, whatever. Somewhere, so I know it's a big ballpark, but either way, it's enormous. When you look at 75 feet to somewhere to 350 feet tall, those are huge walls to try to traverse. And so now you have an army. Just think of how secure you would be within those walls. And not only the height of the walls, but then you talk about these walls that are 32 to 40 feet thick. No one's getting in. The gate itself, and that's why I have the gate here, the gate here itself would have been made out of not wood, which would have been typical. This is iron and bronze, and this is a solid gate. The gate itself, I think I saw, was basically 40 feet high. That's just the gate, and it's locked into place. And then it doesn't show in this picture, so as you go through this gate, what you end up finding is there's a long corridor before you ever even get into the courtyard. And you have these thick walls on both sides, and so even if... The Persians were able to break through this gate and get in. Guess what? It's just throwing them into a funnel and pop, 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 pop. If you have a machine gun, they're just going down. I mean, they're not getting anywhere. You know what I'm saying? So the, the idea of it is this city is impenetrable. It's a fortress. It's magnificent. And not only that, but what you have in this city is you have the Euphrates River flows right through the city. And there was aqueducts that would take this water and filter it through right through the city. And so they had water. They had enough food stored up for years. And that's important to note because in the midst of what we're going to talk about in Daniel chapter 5, that's what's going on on the outside. So what has happened is during this story that we're reading about, King Cyrus has left Persia. He has come to the Tigris River. In order to cross the Tigris River, the story says he actually lost his horse. So his horse goes into the river, gets swept away, and he's angry. Stupid river. And so what does he do in order to cross? He doesn't want to lose any, you know, other resources. So he actually takes, and he has his men, okay, kind of like if you have a lot of boys at home, you can have them dig your stumps. Remember about that last week, okay? So he had his men actually dig trenches to divert the water of the river away from the Tigris so that it became shallower so they could actually cross the Tigris. That's what they did. And he's going to, we'll see, employ that same strategy when it comes to dealing with Babylon. Because here he is, he has surrounded the city, these great walls. They can't get in. And inside, what we find, we're going to look at it here today, inside we're going to find a party. King Belshazzar is inside this city saying, nah, nah, boo, 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 you can't touch me, okay? 
He's stuck inside the city. He's like, I don't care what's going on on the outside. I'm safe and I'm secure. And we're going to see God has other plans for Belshazzar. So here we go. Okay, so King Belshazzar gave a great banquet. This is in the midst of what's going on on the outside. Hey, guess what? The Persians are outside. What should we do? Well, let's have a feast. That sounds like a good thing. Let me demonstrate to everyone how non-worried I am, how comfortable and confident I am. Bring out the wine, bring out the food, let's have at it. So King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. So he's like, look at it, everyone. I'm not worried. You don't need to be worried. I've got this. So what? They're never going to get through our walls. They're never going to get through our gates. So while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, uh he gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So back when, when Nebuchadnezzar in 605 B.C. had first gone in, this is roughly 66 years later. When, when Nebuchadnezzar had gone in, he had conquered the temple. He had taken back with him. It says that. We'll look at that in a second. Taken back some of these vessels uh, that were in the temple, the sacred vessels, taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So this is like, I am so safe and secure. Watch how unworried I am. I will even drink from these sacred vessels that this God who dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not even afraid of God, in a sense, is what we're seeing here. So this just goes to show what I'm talking about. So in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, it says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple. Okay, that's where Nebuchadnezzar took them. These, Nebuchadnezzar, he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So that's where they were. They've been sitting there. And as we know we, from the last time we were together in the book of Daniel, we saw Nebuchadnezzar had a change of heart. And yet, obviously, at this point, Jerusalem's been destroyed. There is no more temple. And so I think really what it is is Nebuchadnezzar has these vessels, and they're kept safe. They're not being used. There's no temple for them to be used in. So Nebuchadnezzar has had them stored away. Well, Belshazzar has a different idea. So just a little bit of background here. This was Nebuchadnezzar's dad. Like I said, I don't speak Babylonian, so I'm not even going to attempt. But 625 to, uh, that should be 605, sorry about that. 605. 605 to 562, that was Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Then what we have is a sequence very quickly of some kings. So what ended up happening, so Nebuchadnezzar, obviously life catches up with him, he dies. This was his son, Evil Morodok. Otherwise, can also pronounce as Evil uh, Marduk, same god that, that would have been one of the premier gods dealing with uh, Babylonians. I believe he was a, a sea god in particular. He, he reigned for, what, two years? Because then something happens. This guy's brother-in-law, Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law, kills him. Okay? So he killed his, his brother-in-law so that he could then take the throne. So you see already these lessons from Nebuchadnezzar have just gone unheeded. It's like, no, no, no. It's not about this god, Nebuchadnezzar. It's about me and what I want, and I'm going to take what I want, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. I see it, I want it, I take it. That's really what's going on. It doesn't end there. So this guy reigned for six years. He died. Don't know this in a while. I'm sorry, four years. Uh, then his son, Labasi Marduk, took the reign. He only reigned for about three to nine months. This one says three. Other sources show nine months. Three to nine months. He was a kid, pretty much. And the reason that he only reigned three to nine months is because Nabodonus killed this boy, and he was just a boy, so that he could take the throne. What we don't know is Nabodonus's background. He may have been somewhere linked to Nebuchadnezzar directly by um, gender, or not gender, um, family relation, okay, by blood. We don't know that. There's very sparse as to what, what took place there. It's believed more so along the lines that he's probably somewhere in this regards an in-law as well. So there's a connection. The queen, we're going to see this in a moment, the queen, whether Nebuchadnezzar's wife or daughter or somewhere who has been around long enough to know about Daniel is going to have an influence in Nabodonus, actually technically Belshazzar. So here's the deal then. This is all history stuff. So Nabodonus, he's the king. He's the true king. He's the right king of Babylon. However, he decides to move south for the winter, and he goes to Tema, which is actually south and east of of Babylon, and he leaves his son, Belshazzar, as the ruler of Babylon. 
And so in all aspects, it would have looked like Belshazzar was the king. So he was acted as king. He's there. No, uh, Nabonidus is nowhere near. He's not nowhere to be seen. And so in the reality of it is, Belshazzar is just as much of a king. And so when you see that written in Daniel, that the king Belshazzar, he was for the most part a king. And there's evidence of that. We'll point to that in here in a little bit. We'll hustle through. Don't, don't fret. I know some of you are like, well, seriously, it's 625. You haven't hardly gotten new to it. It flows pretty well. Here we go. So... They brought in the gold goblets. This is after Belshazzar saying, bring me these gold goblets that we may drink from them and have our revelry and mock this God of Israel. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. Oh, look at this. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. As they're drinking from these sacred vessels... They're praising these gods of wood and of iron and of bronze and of gold and of silver and of stone. And nowhere is Jehovah mentioned. He would have known. Belshazzar would have known of the stories of what God had done, this mighty God from Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't that far removed. And we're going to see the influence there. He would have known. And yet, despite what he knew, now I'm doing my own thing. We see evidence of it. And i got a lot of verses here. I'm probably going to just buzz through some of these. I'll give you the reference, and you can kind of maybe jot those down and look at them on your own. But I don't know that we have time to go through all of that here this morning. So in Hosea chapter 4, verse 12. So God speaks oftentimes through his prophets. And as he speaks through his prophets, what you end up finding is obviously prophecies, but they, they point to the same cyclical theme that you see over and over again. This is what he says in Hosea chapter 4. My people, they consult a wooden idol. And a diviner's rod speaks to them. A spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. And it just shows this contrast. My people, they're, they're turning to, to something that doesn't speak to them. They're turning to a piece of wood. We see more evidence of it, like in Jeremiah 10. No one is like you, God. Okay, this is basically just praising God and who he is. Jeremiah is saying, there is none like you. And then we buzz up here into verse 8 and says, they are all senseless. This is talking about those who have turned away from God. They're all senseless and foolish. Listen to why they're senseless and foolish. They are taught by worthless wooden idols. They're taught by wood. Oh, piece of wood. Tell me what to do. Hammered silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. What the craftsmen and goldsmiths have made is then dressed in blue and purple and all made by skilled workers. They're all made by humans. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure its wrath. We're going to see that in a moment. Psalm 115. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. In other words, those things that you value, are they more valuable than God? I think most of us say no. But yet, how do we treat them? Do we put them in a place where they don't belong? They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Back to Daniel 5. Suddenly, as the king is having this or drinking this stuff from these sacred vessels, they're saying, oh, praise the God of silver, praise the God of gold, praise the God of wood, etc., etc." It says, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand. It's interesting, I, and I didn't see any commentaries address this idea, but near the lampstand, and here's my theory on that, why it even specifies that. It was in a place that was well lit so that it could be seen. This was intended to be seen. It was intended to be observed. It wasn't something done in secret just for nobody or someone just to come across later. This was intended for everyone to see it when it happened. And so there it is, right in broad daylight, relative, broad daylight near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. Oh, it's one of those things where you kind of see the enemy is like, it serves you right. Okay? His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned his enchanters. Same thing as we've seen uh, Nebuchadnezzar do in the past. 
He sought these, these Chaldeans, these astrologers, etc. Then he said to these wise men, whoever reads this writing and tell me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain around, placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler of the kingdom. It's interesting, why the third? Because he can't give the first high because that's an abodingness. He's the second, so he's offering it to the third. Okay, do you understand the, the train of thought there? Okay. Then all the king's wise men came to him, very reminiscent of what we find in Daniel chapter 2, right? Nobody can do this. It's an impossible task. God has done something that no one else can do unless God gives the power for someone else to do it. So then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar came, became even more terrified. He's like, what in the world is going on? I saw this hand. He wrote on the wall. Nobody seems to know what it says, let alone what it means. So King Belshazzar came even more terrified, and his face grew more pale, and his nobles were baffled. This is my favorite part, at least one of them. I have several favorites. This is one of them. So the queen, okay, this is not Belshazzar's wife. This is a queen mother of some form. Right? So whether it's his dad's wife or whether it's actually even Nebuchadnezzar's wife, we don't necessarily know. This is all we know about her. But she knew of the past. She knew of Nebuchadnezzar. She knew of God and what God had done. And not only that, she also knew this man, Daniel, and she knew him well enough to be able to say some of these things. So the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles came into the banquet hall, may the Lord, or may the king live forever, she said, don't be alarmed, don't look so pale. So she hears this ruckus, and she comes in, and it's like, what's wrong with you, you spoiled little brat? Okay, why, why all the noise? And so she comes in and says, why are you looking so pale? Stop playing Xbox. Start paying attention. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. You're throwing this old big fit and you have no idea what's going on. You have no idea what you have available to you because you're ignorant. There's a man in your kingdom who can do this. In your time, or excuse me, in the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Oh, really? Who is this guy you're talking about? Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him, this man, as chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. At this time, Daniel's probably in his 80s, probably early 80s, but he's in his 80s. I'm sure probably well forgotten by Belshazzar. Ah, the man's old. Put him in a nursing home. We don't need to care what he thinks. And yet here is the queen recognizing this, what God has put value in and esteemed. There's great wisdom in that. And there's something for us to learn about that. You know, students, it's important that you're paying attention to the generations before you because the lessons that they have learned and are passing down are not ignorant. We we'll probably save ourselves a lot of trouble if we could learn from that. If, this is what the king says to Daniel, if, Daniel, by the way, buddy, if you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler of the kingdom. We're going to talk about the third. Then Daniel answered the king. I really enjoy this. It's also one of my favorites. Daniel said to the king, you can keep your gifts. I'm 82 years old. I don't need what it is that you're offering. I don't need a purple robe. I don't need a gold chain. And to be third and the highest, big deal. Okay? In other words, I think what even Daniel's even thinking, we don't know this yet, he's like, big deal. You're going to be dead tonight anyway. Okay? So Daniel says, big deal. I don't need your stuff. Give it to someone else. But yet, nevertheless, I'll tell you what this writing says, and I'll tell you what it means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father, and this is really important. Look at what Daniel is saying. He's pointing back to the lessons that he knows Belshazzar already has heard. Daniel is pointing back. It's like, you have been ignorant. You have chosen to go against that which you knew to be true. You knew it to be true, and yet you have disregarded it. That's important to know because it helps us with that contrast between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Your majesty, the most high God, that's God Jehovah, gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, he gave him, that's important to note too, gave him sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position God gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. I was one of them. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when Nebuchadnezzar's heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he, God, 
excuse me, he, Nebuchadnezzar, was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal until he, until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets him over anyone he wishes. That's the lesson Belshazzar would have heard it before. Daniel says, you've been ignorant. Pay attention. You knew this. You chose to disobey anyway. Now look what he has to say. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself. You know, we look at the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar did not often humble himself. We see him time and time again. And yet God then cuts Nebuchadnezzar down, but he restores him. Why the difference this time? I think one reason is Belshazzar knew what to do and still chose not to do it. King Nebuchadnezzar, you could argue the same. However, this would have been Babylonia's first opportunity to really be encountering this God, Jehovah, in this way. And so I think in some capacity, God used Nebuchadnezzar to say, now you are going to be my servant, my vessel, by which I'm going to start spreading this gospel to all of these Gentiles, all of Babylonia. And so they're going to start looking to you and the decisions that you made to align their lives with. The queen, I think, grasped it. But I don't think Belshazzar does. So instead, rather than humbling yourself, you have set up for yourself against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines, you drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold and of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. Basically, you praised a bunch of stupid gods that aren't even gods. Oh, precious two by four. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life. Oh, isn't that something? You did not honor the God who holds in his very hand your very life and all your ways. You don't understand. He put you where you are. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote this inscription. Here we go. This is, I know we've all been itching, like, tell me what was written on the wall, for crying out loud. So, this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Thank you for understanding that. So here's what, in a nutshell, here's what the words mean. This is, again, scripture, and I'll kind of talk about a little bit more of that absolute literal and because the translators have taken it and accurately described what this actually means. And so it's mene, uh, which basically means, would mean numbered. Okay, so it's like it'd be numbered, numbered, and then the idea of tekel would either be measured or counted. And then the final one was peres, where it would be, uh, it's divided. So the idea of what would be is numbered, numbered, counted, divided. And to break that down was really mean like, uh, your sins are numbered. And not only that are they numbered, they're numbered and numbered because your sins are vast. Okay, well, that's just Belshazzar, that's not me. Well, here's the problem. The Lord has revealed to me over and over again these number of weeks, you know, how prideful I am. And so it's like, man, you're sinful. Man, you're sinful. Thanks. I could use some encouragement here now. But then the word tekel means, and not only that, are you sinful. In other words, your sin, your sin, numbered, numbered, they're counted against you. Okay, I'm holding these things against you. And then finally, this word divided basically means because you have sinned so greatly, I've counted them against you. I'm cutting you off. I'm cutting you down. So Tekel, so many says, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Peres, you, your kingdom is divided and given unto the Medes and the Persians. Notice the, the difference here. Basically, it's the same root, same word in the sense. So I, I know it looks like all well, those are two different words. They're really not. Okay. Uh, then at Belshazzar's command, and first look at this arrogance. At Belshazzar's command, Daniel was closed. Oh, thank you so much for telling me what these words mean. In case you haven't noticed, I'm surrounded by these walls. Okay? In case you haven't noticed, I've got enough food and water and wine to last me years. This isn't going to happen anytime soon. Because if you didn't realize the, the Persians are on the outside, I'm on the inside. They're not getting through. So it's like, Give Daniel his clothing, whatever he's got in mind here, whatever he's translated, it's not happening anytime soon. So then Belshazzar's command, Daniel with clothes in purple, gold chain placed around his neck, and he's proclaimed third highest ruler of the kingdom. Uh, this third highest ruler may have been the shortest ever because it probably lasted a few hours. Okay? That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. How did this happen? Well, the Persians, because of their ingenuity in the Tigris River and how they diverted the water, they do the same thing. 
the Euphrates that runs right through the middle of town in Babylonia. So the king set up an army basically at the, at the tail end of the river. He set one at the head of the river on both ends of the city. And then he takes his, his regiment, he takes his, his, his soldiers up farther north, and he begins to divert the water again from the Euphrates. So that when he says to his guys, okay, when the water gets low enough, you can pass, go in. So they go in through the aqueducts, and they take the city while they're all drunk and reveling and partying. Right after all this happened, he lost his life that very night, and his arrogance was cut down. And then Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. And we'll talk more about Darius next week with Daniel. I kind of have to wrap up, but I, there was this passage in Isaiah, and it just kind of pointed to who this God is. And it, it points to this reality. Sometimes we struggle with, why does God put these people in leadership? I don't have all those answers, but yet God orchestrates that which he wants to orchestrate. He puts Nebuchadnezzar in place because he sends us a message based on Nebuchadnezzar's, not only his arrogance and his pride and how he was cut down, but his repentance. I see that, and I want to repent the same way that Nebuchadnezzar did. I see Belshazzar in this capacity. It's like, I don't want to fall into that same trap and not heed to that which I have been taught, not heed to that which I have been uh, learned and have known. And this is what he says in Isaiah chapter 45. This is about King Cyrus. So this is what the Lord says to his anointed one. And what's so amazing, and this is a, this is a pagan king, again, in Persia, who's going to do some great things on behalf of Israel. It's this King Cyrus that actually ends up sending some of these guys like Nehemiah. Well, it wasn't Nehemiah, that was Xerxes. Something like that. Anyway, but anyway, it starts sending some of these people back to Jerusalem. He's the one that kind of ends that exile, this King Cyrus. So this is what it says, the Lord to his anointed King Cyrus. And we have this picture of Cyrus actually not being equated with, but demonstrating. So what you see Cyrus do and the deliverance that Cyrus brings, he also then is prophetic. And you actually see this actually flows a little bit with the prophecy of the Messiah. It's like, what? Seriously, with a pagan king, you're doing that? Yeah, I can understand King David, you did that. But this with Cyrus? What in the world? To his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you. I will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze. This is dealing with Babylon. Isn't that something? What a prophecy. And cut through the bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you excuse me, may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. Verse 13, I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all of his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. Gather together and come. Assemble you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to the gods that cannot save. Turn to me and be saved. Here's our message. It boils down to this. Turn to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. Does this not fit with the lessons that we see over and over again with Daniel? By myself I have sworn. I love that. God doesn't need to swear on anyone else. He swears on himself because he is righteous, he is holy. My mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow. By me every tongue will swear. Confess is another word that we oftentimes see. What is it that you value? I just want to challenge us to look at where is our deep value? If there's something that you will not let go of for fear of losing it, you won't let go of it because like God's maybe saying, you're putting something above me. It's like, ah, I can't let go of this. You know, you're okay with it. And we hold on to it so tightly. There's a, there's a warning sign there that I'm holding on to something that I shouldn't be holding on to quite so tightly. And I believe we all have something. I don't think there's anyone in here that probably doesn't wrestle with that because we are prone to wander. We are prone to basically turn from the God that I love. And I don't think that's where our heart is at oftentimes, but we're prone to it. So let's take some time and let's reflect that which we value. And let's say, God, I want you above anything and everything else. You are the God who says, I just love to turn to me and be saved. Every knee, whether you want to or not, at some point, every knee will bow. And by me, every tongue will confess. I'm going to invite Lane and Kevin and the worship team up.
I want you to reflect on, on this as we conclude. Where do you value things? Where do you value the Lord? Stand and sing with us.
So I like citrus, but mostly I like grapefruit. But it's interesting. So I have a just a brief illustration. I'm going to wrap up with um, what's fascinating is you know the grapefruit. It's difficult to find grapefruit juice that doesn't have sugar in it. So I switched to an orange because. Grapefruit juice without sugar is just like, wow, that's really tart, makes you pucker. And then your wife comes by and thinks that you're looking for a kiss, and that's really not what you intended, but you just eat and drink some unsweetened grapefruit juice. Uh, it's an orange, you know, and, and this one is, it's just no preservatives, no additives. It's, what's, it's really what's, what's pure. But what's interesting is what we end, oftentimes do is, it's like, oh, this is, this is orange, but it's filled with you know, sugar and other things that I can't pronounce. But there's times where it's like, that's what I want to indulge in. I'll be honest, that's, that's just that's what I want. And so I'll take that and I will drink that. Or, you know, maybe it's even worse for us. Add a little bit of carbonation, it's orange crush. It's just, you know, we have all kinds of different options. And the reality of it is, there's only one thing that's actually pure. And so we will consume all these different options. Oh, there it goes. But there's only one, you know. But that's what we do in our lives, too. There's certain things that we value. I mean, I, I drink vitamin water. I like it for the most part. That's, that's fine, kind of. But when I take, start taking this and I substitute that which can only be pure, I think we're missing it. And I think that's what Belshazzar did. He found all this fake stuff to try to fill his life with. And he was missing that which was pure. And so let's not miss that. That's kind of the bottom line. Let's, let's not miss that. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Your grace is just crazy. We sin, let's be honest, over and over. Sometimes the same thing. Sometimes we sin in ways that we're not even aware of. And you're bringing that conviction. It's like, man, I don't want to deal with that. And yet you do it. Thank you, though it's uncomfortable. But bottom line, Lord, help us to see this deep, rich value that we can only find in Christ. It's not an easy road, but it's a pure road. It's a road that we can taste and we can see and know how good you are. It's the only thing that really satisfies. It's the only thing that's really pure. Everything else is just kind of a farce. Everything else just kind of is fake, an imitation. But Lord, you are what's real. Help us to see you. Help us with those things that we value to reprioritize as you desire for us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.